Shawn Michaels is perhaps the greatest in-ring performer of all time. With a high flying ahead of his time athletic style, he was instrumental in changing the landscape of American wrestling in the 90s in a way that laid the groundwork for the modern day, carrying with him a catalog of classic matches that few, if any, can compete with as he did. Yes, over the course of two separate career runs, he's proven he can stand up next to the best of them, whether that's on the mic or, more importantly, in the ring. So join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey in Heartbreak Kid, The Shawn Michaels Story. Michael Shawn Hickenbottom was born on July 22, 1965 in Chandler, Arizona, though as a military child, he would spend much of his youth moving around to places as far sprung as Reading, England, before settling in San Antonio, Texas. The youngest of four siblings, Michael, who would go by Sean to his friends, quickly developed a chip on his shoulder and his desire to be the best at everything saw him getting involved in football at just six years old, with him later finding success in this sport as a star linebacker and captain for his team at Randolph High School. Still, this wasn't what he wanted to do with his entire life, as the young Hickenbottom had been bitten by the wrestling bug at an early age after having grown up watching WWE. That was how, after a short stint at Southwest Texas State University, he decided to change course and begin training as a wrestler under Jose Lothario in the early 80s. And by 1984, he was ready to hit the ring for the first time, now going under the ring name Shawn Michaels. His debut match would see him go to Mid-South Wrestling, where he lost to Art Cruz, impressing many of the veterans there with his performance that night. After that, he spent the next few years honing his craft, moving around the territory system from places like World Class Championship Wrestling in Dallas to Central States Wrestling in Kansas City. And it was in the latter that he began teaming with Marty Jannetty, the two then going by the name of The Midnight Rockers and briefly winning the NWA Central States Tag Team titles together. Soon after, and the success of this team would catch the attention of Vern Gagne, who invited the Midnight Rockers to come and join the American Wrestling Association, where they would also win Tag Team Gold. And from there, things were looking up even more, because Vince McMahon managed to poach them away to WWE in 1987, signing both of them to a big-time contract. That was until he fired them just two weeks later after an altercation the team had gotten into at a bar angered the boss enough for him to cut ties. This anger would only prove to be temporary, however, because by 1988, they were back in the Fed, now with their team name being shortened to the Rockers. And pretty quickly, Michaels and Jannetty's high-flying style and good looks made them a hit with women and children as over the next couple of years, they slowly rose up the ranks, becoming television stalwarts in the process. By October 30th, 1990, they even had an unofficial WWE Tag Team title reign after beating the Hart Foundation. At the time, this was supposed to be a formal title change, but due to the top rope breaking mid-match, Vince McMahon decided not to air it, promising the teams that they would redo it at a later date instead. Unfortunately, plans changed and this later date never ended up coming, something which must have been a blow to the two young up-and-comers. On screen, this disappointment would manifest itself with Michaels turning on his partner on the January 11, 1993 episode of Wrestling Challenge after an interview segment on Brutus Beefcake's The Barbershop ended with the San Antonio boy super kicking his buddy, then throwing him headfirst through a glass window in a scene that has since become iconic to wrestling fans everywhere. This was originally planned to lead to a big match between the two at WrestleMania 8. However, Party Marty would find himself getting fired once again before this could take place, a problem that would recur for him again and again over the years as he continued to flounder, while Sean rose higher and higher up the card, giving birth to the idea that the weaker member of a team would be known forever thereafter as the Genetti. It was also around this time that Michaels developed the gimmick of the Heartbreak Kid, a narcissistic heel who would initially be accompanied to the ring by a mirror-carrying sensational Sherry. And this, combined with his always excellent in-ring work, was enough to sell audiences on him as a top-level heel, with him quickly rising up the singles ranks by beating Tito Santana at WrestleMania 8, and then challenging Macho Man Randy Savage for the WWE title soon thereafter at the UK-only UK Rampage show. Following this, his stock rose even higher as he took part in the company's first ever ladder match, losing to Bret Hart at the July 21st taping of Wrestling Challenge. This, as it turned out, would only end up becoming a precursor to the game-changing ladder match Sean would put on just two years later, 
but in the meantime, he continued his feud with the Hitman in a champion vs. champion match for the WWE title at the November 25, 1992 Survivor Series, this being after HBK and Hart had won the Intercontinental and World titles respectively earlier that year. Of course this, while a very good match, would be wildly overshadowed by the second Survivor Series encounter the two would have years later. However, it shouldn't be slept on and is definitely one worth watching to see the two stars blossom into main eventers together. And though he didn't win the big one that night, Michaels continued his Intercontinental title run into 1993, eventually adding a bodyguard in the form of Diesel to his act. Unfortunately, this reign would be cut short though because he would be suspended in September of that year after testing positive for steroids, with him being stripped of the belt as a consequence. By the time of his return, he would enter into a feud with the interim Intercontinental Champion Razor Ramon, with the two battling over who was the real champion in the lead-up to WrestleMania 10. This would climax with a now legendary ladder match at that event which we've discussed in more detail over on our Scott Hall video, but for the sake of brevity here, we will just say that it remains one of the greatest wrestling matches ever to this day and sparked a whole match type in its wake that continues on even now. After failing to retain the Intercontinental title that night, HBK next set his sights on conquering the tag team division instead, as he and Diesel started mowing their way through every team in their path, eventually winning the tag team titles on August 28th of 1993. And the next day at SummerSlam, Sean accidentally cost his tag partner a match against Ramon, this starting a storyline where Big Daddy Cool would gradually turn babyface and split from the Texas native over the next few months. Later that year, and Diesel would even win the WWE title, further angering his by then former teammate as he had managed to reach the top of the mountain before him. This led to the Heartbreak Kid entering himself into the 1995 Royal Rumble match at number one and eventually winning the whole thing, booking himself a shot at the champion's title at WrestleMania 11 as a result. Unfortunately, when the time came for that match, however, he would lose, but his performance that night, combined with his performances in the months leading up to it, were by then drawing so many cheers from the audience that Vince McMahon decided to turn him babyface the following night on Raw, this beginning his rise to the position of face of the company. And while Sean certainly had the in-ring skill to merit this position, it also helped that by then, he and his friends Diesel, Razor Ramon, Triple H, and the 123 Kid had formed a backstage collective known as The Click, with them often wielding their backstage influence to put themselves in favorable positions at the expense of everyone else around them. And with these guys helping him out, Sean went on to win the Royal Rumble for the second time in a row on January 21, 1996 this time booking himself a WrestleMania 12 title match against his old rival Bret Hart. That showdown would eventually take the form of a 60-minute Iron Man match, with both competitors exhausting each other for a full hour after neither was able to get a fall. After the time limit expired then and no winner had been decided, it took a sudden death overtime before HBK could hit his opponent with two super kicks, finally pinning him to realize his boyhood dream and become WWE Champion for the first time. In terms of the actual match that took place that night, well, that's divided fans for years, with some calling it the greatest WrestleMania main event of all time, while others consider it a snoozer that went on for way too long. Whichever side of this argument you fall on, it was a testament to the athletic ability of both men that they were able to do it at all, and it would see the rivalry begin to spill over into real life as at the end of the match, Sean allegedly instructed the referee to get Brett out of the ring so he could celebrate leaving the hitman feeling disrespected as a result. After that, the former champion took the majority of the rest of the year off as Michaels established himself as WWE's number one guy, defeating a series of challengers that included the likes of Vader, Mankind, and the British Bulldog, before briefly losing the gold to Psycho Sid at that November Survivor Series, then winning it back at the 1997 Royal Rumble. And this was supposed to start the build to a big-time rematch between HBK and Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13. However, before that could happen, the champion would suffer a controversial knee injury and quote, lose his smile, announcing that he was being forced to vacate the title as a result. This only served to heighten the real-life heat between Michaels and Hart, as the latter felt that the injury was being faked and was just an excuse to get out of having to lose to him on the grandest stage of them all. By now, of course, the Heartbreak Kid's backstage issues were becoming notorious, and it wasn't just the hitman who was feeling the brunt of them, as pretty much everyone in the company found the now former champion impossible to work with. 
In fact, had it not been for his almost supernatural skill level in the ring at this time, he likely would have gotten fired multiple times over. But as it stood, he was, aside from maybe Hart, the best performer in the company, and so got to do pretty much whatever he wanted, his ego and his growing drug problems leading to a whirlwind of chaos following him everywhere he went. When he did return to the ring in the spring of 1997, he started a program where he became unlikely tag team champions with Steve Austin. However, he continued to goad Bret Hart as well by aiming a number of promos at him, namely the now infamous Sunny Days promo, where he not so subtly implied that Bret was having a real-life affair with Sunny, something which caused Hart many problems at home afterwards. Seeing that things were reaching the point of no return then, the hitman tried his best to be the bigger man and settle things once and for all telling Sean backstage one night that he had a lot of respect for him as a performer and that he would happily do the job for him again when the time came. His rival's response to this only made things worse though as he allegedly told him that he would not be willing to lose to him, a significant mark of disrespect in the wrestling industry. While this feud was growing more and more intense by the day, behind the cameras, WWE were still intent on trying to get the big rematch in the ring, something they tried again at King of the Ring 1997 before a knee injury suffered by Brett put a stop to this. The next opportunity after that came at Survivor Series 1997, a night that would go on to live in infamy for wrestling fans as the Montreal Screwjob. Now we could do a whole video about this in itself, but the cliff notes are that Brett, who was by that time the WWE Champion once again, was leaving the company to go join WCW, but still had to drop the title belt before he left. Unfortunately for Vince McMahon, Hart had a stipulation in his contract that allowed him reasonable creative control of his character for the last 30 days of his run. The boss had wanted him to drop the belt to Shawn Michaels in the Survivor Series main event in Montreal that night, however, feeling disrespected by HBK after their last conversation and being unwilling to lose to him in his home country of Canada, Hart refused. Much of what happened next has been subject to much speculation over the years, but the end result was that McMahon, who was deep in a ratings war with WCW by then, feared the idea of Bret still being seen as the WWE Champion once his contract with the opposition began and so knew that he had to visually get the belt off of him on TV that night. This led to him and a few select others concocting a plan to screw Hart out of the title, having Sean put him in a sharpshooter only for the referee to ring the bell, indicating that the hitman had tapped out even though he hadn't. To someone outside of the wrestling bubble, this whole scene seems ridiculous, but all parties involved took it deathly seriously at the time and Hart would famously trash the ringside area and then punch out Vince for real after he realized what had happened to him. And as a consequence of that night, Sean was once again the WWE Champion, however, would remain a hated figure in Canada from that day onwards. He used this heat to further his cocky heel character however, preparing himself to start a WrestleMania program with Steve Austin as 1998 rolled around. Before this though, he would face The Undertaker at that year's Royal Rumble, the two hoping to settle their score once and for all after having had their legendary Hell in a Cell match a few months prior, one which, to this day, is still regarded by many to be the greatest cage match of all time. Unfortunately, during that Rumble showdown though, Sean would suffer a severe back injury, leaving him unable to perform for the next two months. He did manage to get into the ring for the Austin fight at WrestleMania 14, however, you could visibly see the agony he was in throughout it, and as a result of this, afterwards, doctors told him that this injury was too severe and that he would be forced to retire. This hit Sean hard, of course, and to deal with it, he sank more and more into a cocktail of drugs and depression, eventually hitting rock bottom after being fired from the company and cut off by his real-life best friend Triple H. This caused him to have quite literally a come-to-Jesus moment when he found God soon thereafter, becoming a born-again Christian and starting to slowly rebuild his life once more. By 2002, he was by all accounts a changed man and had rebuilt many of his past broken relationships within WWE again. What had also happened during this time off was that his back had healed, this meaning that on the June 3rd episode of Raw that year, he would formally come out of retirement, beginning a program with the game that would lead to a classic unsanctioned match at the August 25th, 2002 SummerSlam, where the Heartbreak Kid proved he hadn't lost a single step. From there, he only seemed to age like a fine wine as he had briefly become world champion again at November's Survivor Series, and then had another classic match against Chris Jericho at WrestleMania 19. 
At WrestleMania 20, he stole the show again when he took part in the Triple Threat World Title match with Triple H and Chris Benoit, furthering the idea that he was Mr. WrestleMania. And at WrestleMania 21, he added to this legacy even more when he had a match of the night contender with Kurt Angle. Yes, while many saw the showcase of the Immortals as The Undertaker's show, HBK was making a strong argument against this fact. And with his mind now finally being in a place where he could properly enjoy it all, Sean was able to have more fun both in the ring and out of it at this time than he ever had before, with even people backstage who had actively hated him during his first run now having to admit that he was different. Still, there were glimmers of the old HBK that would show themselves from time to time, most notably during Michael's match with Hulk Hogan at August 21, 2005 SummerSlam where, after being upset with the Hulkster's backstage politicking during the preparation for the night, he comically oversold for his opponent, turning the whole thing into a farce. From there, by time 2006 rolled around, Sean started a feud with Vince McMahon himself, one which would lead to an underrated match at WrestleMania 22. Later in 2006, HBK and Triple H reformed D-Generation X, the team they had initially started way back in 1997. This time, however, with the former's born-again status, the whole thing was far less risque than it had been before, focusing instead on more childish comedy segments, something which divided fans at the time. Still, it didn't matter much to him because he was enjoying every second of it as DX feuded with the McMahons over the course of that summer. Unfortunately, an injury suffered by Triple H would put an end to this run though, and instead, Sean returned to singles action, giving John Cena arguably his best match ever at the time as the two squared off at WrestleMania 23 just a few months later. And at the next year's WrestleMania, he gave fans another instant classic when he retired Ric Flair in what was one of the most emotional moments in the company's history. It should have been obvious where this was all leading, of course, and in the build to WrestleMania 25, things finally came to a head when HBK challenged The Undertaker, the same man who had delivered the back injury which had retired him for four years, challenging the dead man to put his undefeated streak on the line as he proved that there could only be one Mr. WrestleMania. On that night, any expectations fans had were not only met but blown away as both men had what is regarded by many, if not most, to be not only the greatest WrestleMania match of all time, but arguably the greatest match of all time. HBK wouldn't be able to end the streak though that night, and over the course of the next year, this would eat away at him. By the time WrestleMania 26 rolled around, in fact, he laid out one more challenge to the Phenom, this time telling him that if he couldn't beat him, he would retire altogether. This second match had almost impossible expectations to meet then, but somehow it met them, with some even preferring it to the first. Part of the reason for this was the added stakes of it now being a career versus streak match, a stipulation that was ultimately held up when, after 23 minutes and 59 seconds, The Undertaker pinned Michaels to put his career to rest once and for all. Yes, for the heartbreak kid, it was over. He had finally decided that it was time to hang up his boots, a two and a half decade long career now behind him. And while it was hard for fans to accept he was gone at first, his lengthy career had seen him rack up a resume of matches that put him in the conversation for the greatest in-ring performer of all time, so they had a lot to go back and rediscover all over again. Following that, Sean would stick to his guns and, despite calls for him to return, he remained in retirement. Of course, he still did make the occasional on-screen appearance. In 2011, to much fan approval, he was also inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame by Triple H himself and would be later joined on stage by many of his former Click cohorts to celebrate. And in 2016, he became a trainer at WWE's Performance Center, allowing him to help build the next generation. It seemed then that he was content to never step in the ring again. However, much to the surprise of everyone, he would end up making a special one-night return at November 2nd, 2018 Saudi Arabia show Crown Jewel in a pretty dismal match that saw him team with the game to take on The Undertaker and Kane. Sadly, it was one that all involved would like to forget, and Sean has since gone on to say he regretted taking part in it. Most fans, as a result, have chosen to mentally block this one out then, as they instead remember HBK for the performer he had been during both his first and second runs. And when it comes down to it, that's all anyone will remember, because over the course of not one, but two careers, Shawn Michaels has proven himself to be the absolute best when it comes to performing in the ring. 
Half of your favorite wrestlers today probably would never have gotten started if it had not been for him, and his catalog of classic matches could put anyone else's to shame. His ladder match with Razor Ramon, Iron Man match with Bret Hart, unsanctioned match with Triple H, Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker, streak matches with The Undertaker, as well as his classics with the likes of Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle, and John Cena on top of that have proven that no one can step up to him when he's on his game and that he will forever be the icon, the showstopper, and the main event. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.